لازم نحللها فنثبت الحق و نفس الباطل. لا كنت اريد اشير الى هذا، كنت اريد اشير الى هذا. جدا. الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وبعد uh, my dear brothers and sisters uh, again on uh, i will be uh, introducing this lecture or paneling this lecture even though i may speak her uh, due to the absence of our dear brother abu muntasir may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasten his cure and return him back to us Uh, the topic which we have before us this morning uh, has been entitled as uh, Sacrifice, the Cure for the Cancer of Globalization. And it is my great privilege and I am greatly honored to have the opportunity to deliver this lecture uh, with my and our esteemed Sheikh, uh, Dr. Ja'far Sheikh Idris, who perhaps, this being his first time coming to a Jamaat conference, is known throughout the Islamic world as one of the Muslims' world's leading scholars uh, in Islamic uh, teachings, and has, by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, has visited many places of the world, teaching and engaging in da'wah unto Allah, and has had hundreds if not thousands of students graduate upon uh, his hands extending over the last 40 or more years. Uh, the way we will present this lecture is I will begin by discussing globalization in general, and then our esteemed Sheikh, Sheikh Ja'far, will discuss the topic of globalization from a Qur'anic perspective. In other words, that we may mold our ideas and our minds and our feelings regarding this phenomenon which we will introduce today and discuss in light of Allah's final revelation. Now, whenever we want to talk about something, especially if that matter is not found specifically in the Qur'an or the Sunnah, is not defined by Allah and His revelation, or by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in his words, it is important before entering into that discussion, we come across a common definition. For without that common definition, it is very likely, it is very probable, that we will misinterpret and be unable to correctly and effectively discuss the topic before us. Globalization, of course, is this new catchword which has been found in the last 10 years or so uh, in many writings, scholarly and popular writings, is obviously a term which is not found in the Qur'an or the Sunnah. It is not like a term like the term of Iman, where we can refer to a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where the Prophet defines for us that Iman is to believe in Allah and His angels and His scriptures and His messengers and the last day and to believe in Allah's Qadr, the good and evil consequences thereof. If we were to talk about Iman, we have a hadith which defines the reality of Iman, which we can base our discussion upon that concept. And you can take any other sharia reality, whether it is al-birr and al-taqwa, 
whether it is jihad in the path of Allah, whether it is something like the definition of a nikah or a talaq or any matter, and we will have a basis in the Qur'an and the sunnah in order to understand that reality and more importantly how to express that reality and know the responsibilities of a Muslim, male or female, towards that reality. But when we come to these other terms that are coined by human beings, be those human beings Muslim or non-Muslim alike, like the term globalization, it is important for us to begin by defining this term. Because once we agree upon what we refer to as globalization, what it means, then we can determine where this issue, where this concept stands in the balance of the sharia. And we can also determine what are our responsibilities as Muslims toward this matter which we are discussing. Now, the unique thing about globalization is that when I came to try to find a definition for it, I was at loss how to define this matter. And this is because it is a phenomenon, as we will see, that is just appearing. And people are not quite yet certain as to how it will come out. And so therefore, writers, and unfortunately most of the writers being non-Muslims, have attempted to describe this phenomenon from different angles and perspectives. Some of these angles and perspectives are mutually corresponding, and some of them are mutually at odds with each other. And so therefore, for a Muslim to delve into this topic, one must take caution. Not to be swayed by one definition or one perspective of this phenomenon, as opposed to another. But rather take everything and attempt to analyze it using the tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and which formulate the Muslim mind for an analysis. Because you see, the Muslim is not as portrayed by the unbelievers as a fundamentalist in their terms as being a person who is blind to an analytical thought. No. The Muslim knows that there are matters which, for instance, belong to the unseen, belong to legislation, which Allah's right alone, and therefore we describe those realities as Allah has described them, or we inform of commands and prohibitions as Allah has given them. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through this revelation of the Qur'an, has taught us how to think has taught us how to judge matters. And that is why the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa even though we are the Ummah which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down to it, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ It is today which I have completed and perfected for you your religion. We are still an Ummah which is an Ummah of Ijtihad, which is an Ummah of Istimbat, and which is an Ummah of contemplation, whether concerning the natural realities of the world, like Allah's creation, or concerning social organization and political constructs, and likewise concerning history and human events. And so therefore the Muslim, when approaching an issue like globalization, takes these tools which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided him in his final revelation, and which his mind should be molded upon, and looks at these realities, and then interprets these events in light of that. Now, I am not going to say that I'm going to offer that yes. this afternoon. That's a, something for Sheikh Jafar to do for us. But <laughs> what I can do is at least summarize what some of the unbelievers, uh, some of the writers, have used to describe this phenomena of globalization, and which I think, and I hope I am correct in this, my hope in Allah, that represents balanced statements, do not represent extremes regarding the matter of globalization, so we can provide a framework to what are we talking about when we speak about globalization, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Sheikh Jafar will then provide us 
a, a uniquely Islamic scholarly perspective regarding this matter. So what is globalization? Well, as I mentioned, people, when referring to globalization, authors, and primarily non-Muslim authors here we're talking about, tend to look at it from their unique perspectives. And this is not unnatural that people, when approaching a topic, they usually like to approach it from what they are specialist in. So, for instance, you'll find economists will look at globalization from a uniquely economic perspective. Scientists might look at globalization from a uniquely environmental perspective. Politicians will look at globalization from a uniquely political perspective. But we, of course, as Muslims, we have this broad perspective. Now, some of the things that people have used to de describe globalization, and one of the ones that I sort of find myself leaning to, um, that globalization in its essence is time-space compression. Globalization in its essence, one author describes it as time-space compression. What does that mean? It means that the notion of time and the notion of distance, globalization has resulted in this being compressed. So what it used to take a lot longer to do, now we can do it in a shorter period of time. What distance is required much effort or much time to travel now become instantaneous or very close. And indeed, I believe last night we heard Sheikh Jamal refer to this as one of the matters, or one of the um, um, outgrowths of globalization, and also referred to the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, which I referred to in my talk two years ago about the signs of the hour at this conference, where the Prophet wasallam described that among the signs of the hour is that uh, time would be compressed. And also the Prophet ﷺ also referred to another hadith about that distances would also be compressed and the pen would be spread, meaning writing and media and so forth. These are all part of that phenomena which the Prophet ﷺ informed us of. Now others look at globalization from a purely pessimistic view. Um, one non-Muslim author says globalization is in actuality cultural imperialism. This is a non-Muslim. And you find many Muslims, this resounds very well with many Muslims. That what globalization means in its essence is cultural imperialism. It is the taking of one culture and forcing its ideas and its notions and its perceptions and its means and values upon the rest of the globe. Others look at globalization not in quick sentences like that, but look at globalization in a more, what we can say, philosophical viewpoint. For instance, one author argues that globalization, the global age, he says, involves the supplanting of modernity with globality. And that this means an overall change in the basis of action and social organization for individuals and groups. So what is this person trying to say? Well, the Europeans and the Americans, Western civilization, you know, look at history in certain epochs. Just like we Muslims look at history in certain epochs. We have, uh, from the Hadith of Thoban, we look at the, as the Prophet ﷺ, he divided our history of the Ummah as prophethood, and then a khilaf upon the minhaj of prophethood, and then a kingdom uh, which is um, inherited, and then a type of dictatorship, and then a khilaf upon the way of prophethood, and then the Prophet ﷺ was silent. So here the Prophet ﷺ divides our history, our ummah, into five periods. Well, they likewise, they look at their history and their civilization in periods, they look at the classical age with the writings of the Greeks and the Romans. They then look at the dark ages when Europe was at its least most state. And they look at the Renaissance and they look at the Enlightenment and they look at the modern era and now they talk about the postmodern or the global era. So what this person is saying is that we're ending one era, the era of modernism, and we're entering to a new era, the era of globalism. 
And what does this mean? He says it's an overall change in the basis of action and social organization for individuals and groups. In other words, individuals and groups of individual societies will now act differently and will organize themselves differently. Another Western author makes this remarkable claim, not in the sense of a good, but I'm surprised that anybody could be so um, naive to think that only it has happened now. But he describes the global age as the first period in human history where both sexes and all peoples have some substantial way towards asserting an equal right to make their contribution to the common uh, stock of human knowledge. Again, a philosophical bet. But here he's saying that this is the first time in history where everybody can add something to human knowledge or to civilization. And this is, I think, obviously is, is a type of um, mubalaha. How do we say mubalaha in English? Uh, extreme. extreme. Extreme talk. And it denies the, uh, the contributions made by Muslims in their civilization. But we'll come to that at, at a later point in the lecture. Now, others have said that globalization means five major changes. The first one, global environmental consequences due to the aggregate of human activities, meaning that human beings now in aggregation or in, 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 in whole, in sum, their activities have led to now consequences in the environment which affect the world as a whole. So in other words, pollution is not localized, but rather it is uh, affecting the world as a whole, global warming, loss of natural resources, and so forth and so on from what we hear. The uh, opening up of the, uh, uh, the ozone layer and, and, and so forth. Uh, he says the second thing is the loss of security. Why? Because weaponry has, can lead to global destructiveness. In other words, people do not feel secure because anybody, as they used to say, can push the button and send a nuclear uh, intercontinental ballistic missile across the globe and destroy that uh, city. The, glo the, the globalization of the commercial system. The globalization of the communication system. And the fifth thing, which he mentions, and again, this is very unique, I think, uh, but inaccurate, in, as we'll come to see, that he says that globalization has led peoples and groups of all kinds to look at the globe as the framework of their beliefs. In other words, for him, one of the major facets of globalization is that people look at the world now, not from the perspective of their village or their country, but they look at their belief system from, from the perspective of the world as a whole. Now, these, as I mentioned, are just general definitions given by some as globalization and all have a point of truth to it, but I found one author even saying that all this talk of globalization has become quite inflated, that people are talking too much about this topic and are adding to it more than what it really is. So there is a great spectrum of debate. Now, then therefore, what can we say globalization is? I think it is for us as Muslims, globalization, we can best characterize it as this phenomenon which has appeared upon the world due to a number of factors, among which is communication, among which is a change in political system, among which is the mixing of peoples throughout the world in, through transportation, and among which is the economic system which has been resurrected throughout the world, basically the capitalistic system as pushed by the United States, and other factors uh, which are subsequent to that. And if we look at globalization from the perspective of it being a phenomenon, then we should understand that, then therefore globalization is not necessarily an aqidah. It is not a belief where we can say <coughs> that globalization is an agreement with the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah, or in disagreement with that. It is not an action which we can say, yes, this action is in agreement with the Sharia or is against the Sharia, but rather it's a phenomenon, it's a number of things. And so therefore, as being a number of things, we need to not be hasteful and give it a general ruling. 
and make ourselves as Muslims either for or against it, but rather we need to look at every aspect in and of itself, and that aspect we then look at it and say, is it in agreement with our deen or is it at variance with our deen? The problem is that not only are we the objects of globalization, because globalization, when you look at the instruments of globalization, whether it is a political instrument in terms of something like the United Nations as a political organization, or if you look at it in pure politics, pure power, the hegemony of the United States over the world, the fact that we've gone from a bipolar world to a single superpower in the world, or when we look at the economic instruments of globalization, whether it is the World Trade Organization and the GATT Treaty, or whether we look at the, the rise of commercialization and productization and super, uh, what they call the supranational companies, international conglomerates and so forth, and the use of credit cards, whether we look at it as in terms of cultural matters, in terms of uh, drinking Coca-Cola and eating McDonald's and listening to MTV, or whether we look at it in terms of uh, any aspect, unfortunately, as Muslims, globalization, we are the objects of the discourse. In the other sense, that the instruments of globalization, from any perspective, are all unbelieving, uh, instruments of the unbelievers, and in particular, the Americans and the Europeans. We also do not want to make the mistake, then, therefore, that in our response to globalization, we look, we get caught up in the discourse of the unbelievers who are responding towards globalization. We must you have our unique discourse regarding globalization in the sense that we must discuss this issue from purely Islamic terms. You know, when they talk about, for instance, the destruction of the environment or the destruction of the Amazon or the destruction of the ozone or global warming, okay? There's some scientific truth to that. But we should not be caught up in the rhetoric of those who ring the bells of alarm and therefore accept those who talk against it in the same way. We must look at it as Muslim scientists and, in other words, separate the wheat from the chaff. And likewise, when we talk about the New World Order in a political sense, we must also not uh, react to it just from those who are saying, well, one world government and so forth, and they're against this notion. And so therefore, whatever they say in response, we respond like them. Now let me give an example from something from bygone days, which is not necessarily as popular, but at one time when I was growing up, maybe like the age of many of the young people here, you used to hear it often. That of the issue of masonry. Masonry exists. Masonry exists. This is something which nobody's going to deny. But what you found in, amongst, in the Muslim world, that many people reacted towards masonry in the same way as the non-Muslims reacted, who were against masonry, attacked, attacked masonry. So they would write books in Arabic, and some which were translated to English, would make you give you the idea as if the masons... وَالْعَيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ are the Lord of the worlds. They see everything, they plot everything, whatever they want occurs and so forth. So this is obviously the reaction towards this phenomenon of masonry or this belief or this movement. Even though we found people who were against it, we should not be against it in the same manner, but we should be against it according to our Islamic teachings. And the same thing with globalization. If we find... That, I, 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 it was a very interesting thing uh, that um, I, I, I uh, had a discussion with a brother uh, when I first came to London. He was a very beloved brother to me, but, so I don't want to just make it seem like a criticism. But uh, he was mentioning to me how, in our discussion, how he bought a bicycle in order to do his part of environmental uh, conservation. Because of, you know, global warming, I guess that was just what he was trying to say. And I, and I started to think about that. I mean, when he first said it, I really wasn't paying much reflective thought. But then later on, I started to think about that. So who says this is the correct response towards globalization? Are we, and it might be the correct response towards global warming, but is it, are we just because the kuffar, certain kuffar 
against, are against global warming, so they say, okay, we should ride bicycles now. And so therefore, we're going to react as they react. Is this, is this what's happening? So in our response to it, we are responding as the kuffar respond negatively to it. Is this what's happening? Or as we Muslims looking at the matter ourselves and saying, this is the correct response to the matter. So let us take some of the different aspects, the different phenomena concerning globalization and, uh, with the, and make a few comments and then we'll uh, hear from our esteemed shaykh uh, concerning what should be the Islamic perspective uh, regarding globalization, the Quranic perspective, since this is a conference on Allah's final revelation. The first thing you find about globalization is that those who write about globalization tend to look at this phenomena from a very grandiose perspective. I mean, if you're looking at some of the books that were written, some of the major books in the last decade regarding uh, different aspects of globalization, you find the titles to be very large titles and, you know, something which is, uh, one is surprised as, as if this is something which is an unbelievable matter. For instance, one of the first books that tried to talk about, and from a political sense, the change in the political system, uh, before maybe the term globalization was coming out very popular, and in, 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 as we, now is a catchword, uh, was Francis Fukuyama. So he writes this book called The End of History and the Last Man. I mean, this is a very grandiose title. History has come to an end, and man is not going to develop anymore. This is it. Uh, then you have a book which is in sort of response to that by Samuel Huntington in 93, who talks about the class of civilizations and the remaking of world order. Again, a very grandiose title. And in, in the year 2000, a book comes out which tries to talk about globalization from a philosophical perspective, and it's entitled Non-Zero, which is a statistical uh, um, a game that's used. Um, but the, the subtitle, The Logic of Human Destiny. Again, a very grandiose title. What they're trying to say, and this is one of the, 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 um, the arguments which is used by the people um, who are talking about globalization, is that we have no choice regarding the matter. And in fact, one author describes it by saying that the global age involves uh, he says, uh, no, excuse me, he says that the global age, or modernity, uh, holds its inherence in a double bind. It promises new futures and at the same time denies any possibility of an alternative to itself. So in other words, what they're saying is, what's going to happen? There's no other choice to it. It's almost what I, I, I want to call a historical determinism, or we use a, a sort of a sharia term, al jabariya tarikhiya. In other words, we are condemned to this future. We have no choice in it whatsoever. Now this obviously is a reflection not only of the makeup, the psychological and the ideological and sociological makeup of the unbelievers, but also it is a type of information warfare. In other words, these people who are writing the books are also proponents. They're also du'at to globalization. And what they're trying to tell us is that we have no choice regarding the matter. You might as well submit to it and accept it as it is. And it reminds me of something that I once read from Muhammad Qutb, uh, where he mentions in one of his books in a footnote, he talks about the global village, and he says, how strange is this global village that everybody is allowed to live in it except for the Muslim? <laughs> the, the global village, he says, is the global village is such that America is the, uh, the policeman or the bully of the global village, and the Europeans and its allies, the Japanese, are allowed to have a certain estate in the global village. And if the Chinese want to live outside of the global village, it's okay. But the Muslim has no choice either to submit to it or not. So this you know, shows that the, the point of them trying to say to us that it is an inevitability that we cannot have any choice to it. Uh, interestingly, as a, as a side comment, the uh, term global village was first came out in 1962. So it's a very relatively new term. It was written by a person called Marshall McLuhan. He had an essay in 1962. It's the first recorded reference to global vision, at least in the English language, uh, for what's that worth. Uh, but when we look at globalization, as I said, we can look at it from different perspectives. So perhaps the first perspective that people start to notice that there was a change afoot was after the Gulf War when uh, President George Bush, the father of the current President of the United States, uh, in a speech, talked about a new world order. 
And uh, you started to find discussions about how that with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, we are now coming to a new political arrangement. What is that political arrangement? Well, they differed amongst themselves as to what's going to come about. Francis Fukuyama says it's going to be liberal democracies. That's why he said it's the end of history. In other words, what the Americans and the Europeans have come about, you might want to uh, tweak and tune it a bit to make it more perfect, but in the end, this is the end. Humanity can't progress any further than this. Others, like uh, Samuel Huntington, said no, no, no. But rather, we're going to have a clash of civilizations. In other words, people will become regional blocks, and he writes a whole book regarding that, and the West will wane in its power, and so it needs to do certain things to keep its predominance over the world. As he says, the West versus the rest. Um, others uh, talked about the demise of the nation-state. They said that, well, the nation-state uh, is the way people organize themselves in the last 200 years, and this is going to be breaking down. So, for instance, one author says it's going to break down due to the four eyes. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, Kenichi Ohami, uh, wrote a book in 1995 called The End of the Nation-State and the Rise of Regional Economies. And he says four eyes will destroy the nation-state, and that is uh, investment, industry, um, individualism, and information. Because of these four eyes, the idea of a nation state where you have a state that determines for its population its education, its political uh, discourse, its, you know, the state in every sort of thing, its economic policy, so this is going to come to an end. Others say no, that rather the nation state is going to flourish in globalization. And they say the fact that you find the United Nations and having it, all these nations underneath it, this is showing that the nation state will flourish in globalization. So two completely contradictory views, uh, t twice we've mentioned, uh, uh, concerning globalization of politics. Uh, as an economic matter, one of the things which came out concerning economics and uh, globalization uh, is the notion of uh, free trade and the notion of uh, the World Trade Organization. I think many of you are probably familiar with the demonstrations that have occurred over the last year or two in IMF and international debt and so forth, that uh, economic policies are going to switch. And the value of labor is going to switch in the world. Uh, countries are going to produce things differently. Consumption pra uh, practices will be di different. And likewise, everything uh, dealing with trade and currency, they talk about a cashless society and all these different uh, phenomena which will come out of the globalization of economics. Uh, they also talk about the globalization of culture. Uh, one interesting book which came out in 1995, which I think is also telltaling about how Muslims fit in the picture of globalization, uh, was a book by Benjamin uh, Barker uh, called Jihad vs. McWorld. And uh, I, I can't just never forget the image of the paperback version which came out of the United States, uh, where you have a woman fully clad in the ibaya, so she's, you cannot see either her face nor her hands, she's fully clad, and she's holding a Pepsi can. And what are they trying to say? They're saying, they're saying there are two, the author is saying there are two processes, each feeding into the other, and each not necessarily very good. You have the McWorld process, which is Mike McDonald's and uh, Macintosh, everything with his Mc, 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 all these American products and so forth, MTV. And you also have the jihad uh, thing, which is the fundamentalism and the backwardism and so forth, which he calls it the jihad uh, mentality. So in other words, America versus the Taliban, huh? to give it a uh, sort of a... Or the Sudan. Or the Sudan, because of Sheikh Jaffa. <laughs> I will give it a 2001 interpretation. So, so the point is here, they talk about the cultural domination. And in fact, I mean, I found very interesting that, you know, even in 1978... Uh, in 1980, UNESCO uh, talked about the dangers of the fact they called what they called the New International Information Order. And they said, well, all information is coming just basically from four or five sources. AP and UPI from the United States, Reuters from the United Kingdom, and the French agency from France. And that was in 1980. Of course, now you have CNN, right, uh, in, in our time. So they talked about the importance of how to make a balance, because this is a United Nations organization, so that you can respect people's cultural identity and so forth. Um, and likewise, of course, uh, besides this, we mentioned that some call globalization cultural imperialism, and uh, globalization in terms of environmentalism with global warming and so forth. 
Now, the point is these are all facets or different aspects of globalization. Not one of them can be described to be globalization itself. They are all aspects of globalization. I have a couple more comments, and then Sheikh Jaffer will, will, will uh, uh, describe to us, uh, as I mentioned, uh, globalization from an Islamic perspective. Is globalization, as in terms of Muslims, are we, how are we to react fundamentally towards globalization? Uh, and my comments are so much I benefited from Sheikh Jaffer himself, uh, from some of the things he once said to us in a, in a, in a gathering. Uh, Muslims, we should understand that we are the global people. I mean, for these unbelievers, globalization, when they say that, for instance, one of the five major trends of globalization is that people look at the world from a global framework for the first time in human history, that's perhaps for them. You know, even when they try to talk about the roots, the origins of globalization, the furthest back they can push globalization, they say, to the 16th century commercial alliances of European powers. In other words, there was no commercial alliances, no commercial trade across the world until the 16th century. So, for the unbelievers, they are unable to adapt to globalization. And their reaction is twofold. Reaction because they brought, a globalization is being now run by them, and so therefore it is the, the diseases and the problems of their unbelief which is causing these issues. I mean, for instance, like now when they talk about communication, you talk about the evils of communication. What, where are these evils coming from? It's coming from their societies. When you talk about the change in social organization, it's coming because of their societies. When you talk about environmental problems, it's coming because of their waste of Allah's resources, and they are not maintaining it in a proper way. So that's one part of the reaction. The other part of the reaction is that they are, the unbeliever is unable to look at the world from a global perspective. But us as Muslims, we are the global people. Where in the world... And I ask anybody to, to, if you study history or you're part of a university, ask the, hist the, histori the history department, where in the world do you find a historian, like a historian like we have, like Ibn Kathir, who writes a history, al-bidaya wa nihaya The beginning and the end. And doesn't talk about the beginning from human history, from the creation of Adam, but talks about what was before Adam. As the Prophet wasallam said in the very had famous hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, the hadith of Imran bin Hussein, where the tribe of Tamim came to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh, tribe of Tamim, accept the good news. And the tribe of Tamim said, We accept the good news, but give us. And then the Yemenis came, and the Prophet ﷺ said to the Yemenis, Oh, people of Yemen, accept the good news if the people of Tamim have not accepted the good news. And they said, We have accepted it, O Messenger of Allah. And we have come to understand or need to fiqh, to have fiqh in our religion, and to ask you concerning the origin of everything. How did it begin? So the Prophet ﷺ said, "Can Allahu? It was Allah, and there was nothing before Him. Walam yakun shayk qablahu." And then Imran bin Hussein says, somebody announced to him that his camel had. <laughs> had run away, so he had to go chase after his camel, and he said he regretted not sitting there to hear the rest of the discussion by the Prophet ﷺ. So the point is, is that Ibn Kathir talks about history. When he means the Bidai, he doesn't mean the beginning of human history, but he means the beginning of everything. As the Prophet ﷺ said, it was Allah and there was nothing before him. And when he talks about the end, he writes history until just before his death in 7, 774. Maybe his history ends in 772 or 773. And then he adds a volume concerning what will happen before the Day of Judgment and how the people enter into paradise and how the people enter into hell and what they will find in there because we have this detailed knowledge from the Prophet ﷺ. Where do you find in human history or human civilization where you find that the intellectual people of that civilization are people of the likes of scholars who are scholars in more than one field, are able to gather more than one domain of human knowledge. When you read Ibn al-Khayyam, whether it's in Zad al-Ma'ad, and he talks about the prophetic medicine, and also talks besides the guidance of the Prophet, talks about medical knowledge in his field, you think that Ibn al-Qayyam, there was no doctor in history like him. When he talks about the different aspects of human, of the creation, as in Miftah Dar al-Sa'adi, you are amazed at his 
ability to describe natural phenomena. When you read Ibn Taymiyyah's discussion concerning the eclipse, you see, you think that he was an astronomer of our time. When you read about Ibn Khaldun's, you know, discussion of human organization and what they call the uh, sociology and and and, and the history and the uh, philosophy of history, you as if there was nobody who wrote about the topic but him. In fact, I remember there's a person which I, escapes to me his name that Ibn Kathir he mentions in his one of the biographies. He said, and in this year died such and such Sheikh, and this Sheikh he gathered bes- be- besides knowledge of Sharia, but knowledge of a Tabi'a, knowledge of natural. Uh, phenomena. In other words, he was a scientist. This is the, the scholars of the Muslims. And likewise, we are a global people because the civilization of Islam is a global civilization. Until today, with even after Western cultural imperialism and domination, you can still traverse the Islamic world from its most Western region in West Africa, which is more West than, than Europe is. It, it, Africa uh, butts further west than than Europe. And you can go to the furthest east, to the furthest island in Indonesia. And if you were to travel this, you would find a cultural unity, even today. A Muslim could go anywhere and you would recognize things immediately. And you'd be able to fit in immediately. If it was not just for the adhan that you hear five times a day, you're able to organize your daily pattern for that. Let alone that there will be a month when the people will be fasting in Ramadan. Let alone there is a masjid that people go to. Let alone there's a time when people go to Hajj, there is two Eids, that when people are born, they're born in a certain way, that when people are buried, they're buried in a certain way, when people have marriage, they're done in a certain way, all the major milestones in life, and so you find this uniformity. This is, makes us a global people. But yet, you look at every single people as you travel this globe, they'll all have different colors, speak different tongues, have different levels of uh, you know, uh, advancement in terms of material means. So the point is, we are, a, we are the global people. And globalization, uh, we should look at it from a good perspective. And indeed, it's from the beliefs of the people of Ahlul Sunnah that there is nothing which Allah decrees which is purely evil. Nothing which Allah decrees is purely evil. And with that, I will uh, leave uh, for our esteemed Shaykh, uh, Shaykh Ja'far, uh, to discuss to us some of the positive aspects of globalization or perhaps the Islamic perspective to globalization. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا ما يهدي الله فهو المهتد وما يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ثم أما بعد um, I think uh, brother Ali raised your expectations too high about uh, what I'm about to say um, uh, so I must warn you um, my presentation is a very humble one and I can't talk about um, everything uh, that is um, related to globalization from an Islamic point of view. I will limit myself only to one uh, small topic, and I shall uh, explain that to you. I think that, uh, so <clears throat> following uh, Brother Ali's advice, uh, what is globalization? I think we have to uh, when when we talk about globalization uh, we have to make a distinction between uh, at least three matters first the idea of globalization and uh, secondly uh, the technology which made this globalization possible and thirdly uh, particular forms of globalization now we are not against uh, what, 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 is, what is the idea of globalization? Um, I prefer to take just the linguistic meaning. To globalize means to make universal, to make uh, universal what is lo- local. You take something local and you make it universal. Are we against this in principle? No. Uh, are we against the means of globalization? Are we against uh, cellular phones or radio or, or the technology that made globalization possible? No. Uh, are we against all forms of gro- globalization? No. Some forms are good, some forms are bad. 
Uh, so we have to look into, as Sheikh Ali was trying to, to do, look into these different forms of globalization and say, this is good and it should be globalized and it can be glo globalized. This is not good for humanity. It should not be globalized. No Muslim would, sh would say that shirk should be globalized. Hmm? And in, sh in fact, it should not even be local. Hmm? So, so, let alone be uh, universal. No Muslim would say that capitalism should be globalized. Uh, no Muslim sh would say that uh, globalization should be a means of, uh, of, 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 of uh, an imperialism. So we are against this. There are things so, which should not be globalized because they are evil in themselves. There, there are things which should not be globalized, not because they are evil in themselves, uh, but they are, by their very nature, local. Hmm? You should not say that uh, the way Sheikh Ali is dressed should be globalized. Hmm? He can dress like this in Iraq or Saudi Arabia or so, uh, but he should not ask every American or British or so uh, to, to, to be dressed like this. The way we cook should not be globalized. I mean, curry should not be globalized. <laughs> uh, these are, by the very nature, very, uh, very local things. Uh, so, so let us uh, now go to the uh, uh, idea. My topic is this, that uh, Islam is the most qualified way of life to be globalized. Uh, why? And I have uh, some points to share. The first one is that this deen is the only deen which was meant from the beginning to be universal. The Prophet ﷺ is described, uh, Allah ﷻ said that we sent you to all humanity. And he is a mercy to all humanity, as uh, the brother even said, to all creation. And the Prophet ﷺ said, كَانَ النَّبِيُّ يُرْسَلُ إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ خَاصَّةً وَبُعِثْتُ إِلَىٰ النَّاسِ كَافَّةً Every Prophet used to be sent to his community only. إِلَىٰ ثَمُودَ أَخَاهُمْ صَالِحًا إِلَىٰ عَادِ أَخَاهُمْ هُودٍ so uh, each one of these tribes or particular locality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a prophet to them. So much so that there could be two or three prophets at the same time in different places. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the only one who was sent to uh, the world as a, uh, as a whole. So there is no religion like this. No, Jude, no, no, not Judaism, not Christianity, and so on. In fact, if they followed uh, the teachings of their uh, prophets, they would have accepted Islam and, 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 and joined hands with us in globalizing this uh, religion. Uh, in, and, and by the way, I have uh, said several times, in fact, I see in... Uh, uh, what uh, Sheikh Ali called uh, uh, compression of time and space. In fact, I see in this a vindication of the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who, other than the creator of the world, could have known that the world will be like a, a, a village and that it will not need more than one prophet. Now, now, if there are more than one prophets in the world, there will be confusion. Hmm? The prophet in England says something, the prophet in Indonesia says something, and, and, and people get confused. And whatever they say will be immediately communicated to pe people all over the world. So who other than the creator of the world could have known that the world will be you know, compressed and that it will not need more than... Uh, one prophet. <clears throat> the second point is that 
This religion is the religion of human nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسِ عَلَيْهَا So this is, the, the whole deen is based on human nature. This means that the Qur'an does not come with something that is entirely new to the human person. It only confirms what is in, in his heart and it explains to, uh, to the person how to lead a life that is in conformity with, with human nature, with his human nature. So when we uh, invite people to Islam, we are not uh, Arabicizing them, we are not uh, westernizing them. If they westernize, we are not easternizing um, uh, anyone. Uh, of course, we are not northernizing or southernizing. <laughs> uh, we are, in fact, humanizing hum people. We are asking them to lead the only way of life which can be, uh, make them as uh, human as they should be. Uh, so, if we cannot... Uh, because of our uh, weakness now, if the Muslim world is economically and militarily weak, and if we cannot now, inshallah, just for the time being, uh, if we cannot um, uh, uh, يعني, conquer or rule um, lands by uh, our military power, we have the truth, this truth, by which we can win people's hearts. And you don't need military power to do this. You are staying in this country, you invite people to Islam, you change their hearts, and if their hearts are changed, they become Muslims, and every good thing that they have will be Islamic, and it will uh, serve the cause of Islam. We should never think of Islam as something, or, or Muslims, as something يعني, uh, on, on nationalistic or racialistic basis. Islam is not uh, identified with Arabs or Pakistanis or so. Islam is for everyone. So we are not against uh, the British or the French or the Americans, and uh, the Prophet ﷺ was not against the Arabs. We are against falsehood. We are not against any uh, uh, human race or, or, or nationality. We are against falsehood. If we can win people's hearts, make them uh, Muslims, then uh, perhaps uh, this will save us the, um, uh, <laughs> yani the difficulty of competing with them uh, in military power, so, or their military power, really um, Islamic power. And the people who, uh, who served the cause of Islam were not only Arabs. You know, the, uh, our last great uh, empires were non-Arab. One was Turkish, the other was uh, in India, the Mongols, and then the Safawis, and so on. Uh, so we can do uh, the same here, inshallah. Uh, also, uh, we should not think that uh, m many uh, brothers uh, think that to do this, the, all the us Muslim uh, Ummah has to be united. This is not, not necessary. And they will not anyway. Because the Prophet said that they will be divided. So don't try to do the impossible. They will not all of them be united. And you don't need them to be all united. All that we need uh, and, and, uh, a good number of uh, Muslims who follow this way, you know, and inshallah, uh, we will uh, be able to do uh, much in, in this world. Now, uh, the, sec uh, the th third point is that uh, this deen is <coughs> qualified to be globalized or universal because it has proved practically proved it was meant to be universal and the Muslims took this truth to uh, different parts of the world 
and people became Muslims, and they, if you compare Muslims now with any other group that uh, abides by any way of life, whether it is Christian or Jewish or communist or, or so, you will find that the Muslims, despite the innovation that they made in the religion, because in spite of some of the deviations, they still, they are the only people, uh, or say, they are the uh, only people who uh, are still sticking uh, yeah, as much as possible to their religion. As Ali was saying, uh, people pray five times a day. There are no people in the world who say, no, we will pray three times or five times uh, or, or six times. They face the same Qibla. They do this, they do this. There are no... Uh, so this is a proof, a practical proof, that this religion is not confined to any particular place. So it could, if it could uh, cross the, the, the boundaries of these different races and cultures uh, and so on, and remained as it was meant to be, this is a practical proof that it is really a universal uh, religion. So, uh, fourth point. <clears throat> uh, this is the only religion that is in harmony with science. Now, uh, science is a collection of facts and theories and so on, but it is also a method. Many people, when they talk about science, they concentrate on the first part and forget the, the second part. But in fact, Islam is in harmony, not only with the scientific facts, but also with the scientific method. People in the West now, uh, especially and those who are religious, lead a schizophrenic, I always find it difficult to pronounce this word, schizophrenic uh, uh, life. When they, uh, when they do science, they are very rational, they uh, want evidence, and so on. When they come to the religion, they are told to leave their mind at home and, and, um, and accept contradictions and do this. So Islam is the only religion which will solve this problem. So let us start with the facts. Uh, the facts support Islam in two ways, a negative way and a positive way. By the negative way, I mean that you don't find any statement in the Quran which contradicts any uh, scientific fact. And you can't say this about any book in the world, whether it is a scientific book or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Even a scientific book written a hundred years, even in a scientific book written a hundred years ago, you are bound to find statements, you are bound to find forced statements. Because no human being can be 100% right in what they say uh, about the world. So there is no book uh, other than the Quran uh, uh, about which you can say this. And this is, this, this is negative. The positive side is that uh, science discovers facts which support the Quran. The scientists say so and so and so, and the Muslim says, oh yes, I have known this for... Yeah, a long time before it was discovered. Our prophet told us about this, and so. Uh, this about the facts. Uh, I was listening to the last lecture, and I heard the question that one of the ladies, uh, the, the sisters asked. Uh, the, uh, the, she, she said someone who is uh, non-Muslim uh, said, uh, <coughs> uh, if you say, uh, the Quran says that the sun rises and the sun sets, and, uh, and since uh, the, the earth uh, rotates around the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the sun, there is no setting, no rising. I, I thought that the sister should have told him 
to open his newspapers, daily newspapers, and he will find the sunrise, sunset. <laughs> so, so, it is, so it is not only the Quran then that, that is telling them <laughs> uh, falsehood, it is also the newspapers. Hmm? <laughs> and this man forgot something that is called the apparent movement of the, uh, of the sun. Because um, uh, even if you are the best scientist, you will have to say that the sun is here, the sun is there, the sun is there. You don't, uh, yani, how can you talk otherwise? You then say, uh, the rotation of the sun, is, uh, the, of the earth is now so and so, and the angle of the, <laughs> of the place in which you are relative to the sun, to the sun is so, no, we don't speak like this. Uh, human language, is based on appearances. And what applies to sunrise and sunset applies to other things. Suppose that uh, the, the sister should have also told, uh, told this man, do you think that iron is solid? He would say, of course it is solid. So now, science tells us that iron is made up of uh, uh, atoms and um, uh, subatomic particles, and in fact, uh, uh, the emptiness in a piece of, uh, of, of iron is more than the, what do you call it, the, the, the matter there. So, in fact, in science, I mean, iron mm -hmm. is just like, uh, say, a basket of uh, lemon or, or, or so. No. This is not the way, uh, uh, this is not uh, the way people, people talk. Uh, la uh, uh, the the um, language is based on observation, on human observation. This is also, by the way, um, an argument against some of the brothers in the United States who said uh, that we should go by the birth of the moon, mm. not by sighting the moon, but by the birth of the moon, because this is scientific fact. And I said, oh, they should also pray Maghrib eight minutes before sunset, because by the light takes eight, from the sun takes eight minutes to reach us. So by the time we see the sun setting, it had set eight minutes ago. So we should pray eight minutes before the sun. The same applies to uh, sunrise and so on. So uh, this is so there is no there is no fact which contradicts the Quran. Now about the method. You can say that uh, the the uh, scientific method is a rational method, and by rational I just mean that uh, it supports its claims by evidence. If you say so and so is the case, there is evidence for that. But unfortunately, uh, due to the narrow-mindedness of, uh, of people, they confine the expression scientific method to the kinds of evidence that is required uh, uh, in the natural sciences. And this is wrong. You can, uh, you can uh, generalize and say what is required is only evidence. And uh, the kind of evidence required depends on the claim that is made. If I make a historical claim, I, mean, I can't prove it in a laboratory. Hmm? So if I make a claim about the existence of the creator, I can't give you a, a, a microscope and say, look, and you find the, uh, uh, the creator there. Uh, so the Quran and the Islam is the only religion uh, 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 which follows this uh, rational method. You find the Quran full of uh, um, uh, 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 words like, like Burhan, uh, Ayah, uh, and so on. All these are uh, uh, expressions of evidence and method. And the Qur'an, we say that the Qur'an is, is a book of guidance. This is true. But the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about those who are guided that they also are the rational people. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَ اللَّهِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ 
So there is a strong relationship between being guided and being uh, uh, rational. So uh, we think that, inshallah, uh, uh, science itself will uh, uh, help people uh, to, uh, come to, uh, uh, to come to uh, Islam. Uh, uh, firstly, and inshallah, the last one, the, there is something very strange um, uh, regarding uh, globalization in, 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 in the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, the concepts, I mean, the, uh, uh, every Muslim is very familiar with the concepts of uh, what Brother Ali uh, said, uh, described as the compression of time and space. You, you read this in the Quran there, uh, and in the Sunnah of the Prophet. So, as a Muslim, you are, you are very familiar with this concept. You read about someone who brought a throne from Yemen to Palestine hmm? in, a, in, in a time that is shorter than the blink of an eye. I don't know, is that uh, faster than the speed of light? Uh, someone should calculate. And you read that the Prophet Sallallahu told the Arabs that he went to Jerusalem and came back the same night. Now we will not be surprised. Hmm? But the Arabs were surprised. You read in the Quran that uh, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, uh, sent it to heaven and came back. He, he, did, he, he went bef uh, beyond what we now call the universe because the universe that we are talking about is this, um, in principle, observable universe. And the universe that started with the Big Bang. But he went beyond that. To reach the end of this universe in which we are, you need to travel more than 12 billion um, light years. So what about going bef beyond that? You need thousands, perhaps millions of trillions of um, light years. But the Prophet went and, 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 and came back. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tawa lahu al ard Tawa, can I say, shrank or folded? Folded. folded. Uh, folded uh, and, and he saw uh, the end of the, uh, of the earth and what will, uh, will happen. So he did not only see everything on the earth, he saw what will happen even in the future. So a, a, a Muslim is very well prepared and mentally, uh, to accept these concepts of the shrinking of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of time and, uh, and, uh, and space. Uh, there are some uh, problems, some obstacles uh, that make it difficult for us uh, to universalize our religion. I don't want to go into the details of those, but uh, one of them is the ignorance um, of, uh, of Muslims. Uh, the second one is that uh, many of us have been westernized, and so the West uh, f for the Muslims is not only the real West, but some people who are among the Muslims in Egypt or Sudan or Pakistan or so, and who are representatives of uh, Western civilization. Um, some uh, good Muslims have their priorities very wrong. Hmm? They concentrate on criticizing uh, their brother يعني, Muslims or even on very uh, minor issues. And uh, of course, it is good to criticize someone to tell them the truth. But I say that there is a difference between criticizing and waging war. Yeah? If, if, if I tell you, I am a Sunni, ya akhi. I am, and I, I want to follow the way of the Prophet وسلم, and of the Salaf, and uh, you tell me no, because you said so and so. I didn't, never told you that I am infallible. I want to be Sunni, but I make mistakes. Who doesn't make mistakes? Only the Prophet ﷺ. Even the Sahaba make mistakes. The great ulama, whom we call the Salaf, make mistakes. 
uh, uh, only the ummah in its totality is infallible. But as individuals, it is enough just to require of me to follow the way of the, uh, of the Salaf and to be ready to accept the truth when it is explained to me. That is w- what you should require of me. Uh, you should not wage war against me and, and, and behave as if I am the only danger that is facing the Muslim world and forget all about um, uh, the real thing. So many of these good brothers have their priorities wrong. So please help them uh, to correct their priorities. Assalamu alaikum So, Ajazakum uh, al we have uh, 20 minutes of questions, and we have a number of questions. So, I'm going to take one question from, uh, we'll start with the sisters first. Huh? So, and then we'll do a question from the brothers back and forth. And I'm just going to take them as they appear, you know, in front of me. Um, the question is, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, if we had the Islamic leadership, then environmental problems would be dealt with correctly. In the absence of that, don't we Muslims have an individual responsibility to do what we can, eat free-range meat and eggs and recycle paper, and also to avoid multinationals as much as possible, such as McDonald's, MMS, I don't know what that means, Coke, etc. <laughs> well, I, I think, again, uh, the, the sister, may Allah reward her, uh, I, I, her question is a very important question. But if you notice the question, again, the question, the response is not the response that Muslims came up with. I mean, the response to the problem of environmental problems, that we have to avoid multinationals, is a response by certain people among the unbelievers who uh, see, uh, and basically they have a certain ideology. I mean, the environmentalist has a certain ideology behind it. And I know, I know this is not just from a aqidah perspective, but I also know this because I'm a, somewhat of a scientist, pseudoscientist, you might say, but I'm somewhat of a scientist. So that, uh, that they have an ideology uh, to this matter. So we as Muslims, this is what I was trying to stress earlier, we should not make our responses their responses. But we should make our responses to everything what Allah wants of us. Azza Now, uh, do we have responsibilities as individuals? Yes, we have responsibilities as individuals. Whether it's regarding environmental, whether it's regarding social matters, whether it's regarding political matters, whether it's regarding economical matters, we have responsibilities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, we know from the basics of Islamic belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden injustice, has forbidden impression, has forbidden facade, corruption. So anything that you do which is going to lead to that uh, is obviously forbidden. And likewise, there are within the Qur'an and the Sunnah many environmental principles um, for if we were to investigate into deeply. Indeed, one of the uh, professors we have in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, he recently, his, his master's degree thesis or his PhD thesis was about uh, environmental principles just taken from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Presented at Jamat al-Imam So I mean the Sunnah and the Quran expresses information about everything Take one hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Be different than the Jews and, and therefore clean the front of your homes It was the practice of the Jews They used to throw the trash in front of their homes The Prophet Sallallahu said clean the front of your homes Likewise the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade us the wasting of water Even if you were a neighbor to the river. So these are environmental principles. You can deduce much of that. But the point is that to say that, for instance, that we must avoid multinationals, so therefore uh, we shouldn't drink Coke or we shouldn't eat from McDonald's. Uh, I mean, this is not necessarily...